the desert. A terrain of savage dignity. The desert lives large in the human spirit. Biblical prophets emerged from the desert. Christ fasted in one and was tempted there by Satan. This is the Sonoran Desert in southern Arizona, 100,000 of the most beautiful and deceptive square miles in North America. A place where what you're moving to often seems to get farther away. For the Sonoran Desert's long-term residents, the desert is neither savage nor deceptive. It's home, and they named themselves the Aodom, the people who live in the desert. They'd been living in it for thousands of years when a different kind of prophet appeared in their midst. His name was Kino. Hello, I'm Jim Kelty, and welcome to the Sonoran Desert, a place the hero of our story, Father Eusebio Francisco Kino, traveled in all directions. Let's go aloft for a better view. To the north, you can just catch a glimpse of the Santa Catalina Mountains that he named, the farthest extent of his domain. To the east was danger. That was the land of the Apache, enemies of everyone, including sometimes other Apaches. South was Mexico, in Father Kino's day called New Spain, source of all moral and material support for the missionary effort. And then finally, the West, Father Kino's pet project, California. In his day, California was steeped in mystery and legend. One novelist wrote that it was an island inhabited by Amazon, where the only metal was gold. Of these fanciful ideas, Father Kino gave serious consideration only to the first, the part about California being an island. To prove that it wasn't, he wore out more than one saddle horse, not to mention the patience of his superiors. But California was not the place this famous Jesuit notched his highest marks. That was right here in the Sonoran Desert, on the edge of the Spanish Empire. As we go along, you'll pick up a few Spanish words, words dear to Father Kino, words like mas allá, which meant to go beyond, to climb the next ridge, and the ridge after that. Mas allá is about more than geography, though. It's an invitation to go beyond oneself to climb higher in the eyes of God. I'll warn you, keeping up with our hard riding Padre will be a full-time job. So let's get going. The Spanish borderlands Father Kino roamed were vast, with four distinct geographic regions. The Sierra Madre Mountains running north-south along both sides, the central plateau between, the coastal plain along the Sea of Cortez, and finally the rugged peninsula of Baja California. Traveling through Father Kino's Spanish borderlands today, in relative comfort, makes it difficult to experience the rugged terrain and desert climate as he did, something these dedicated pilgrims are hoping to do. So that's, uh, again, as Father John beautifully said, a coming together of many, many elements, and we hope you'll experience that in that way. There's probably no other way to get your arms around a story as vast and boundless as Father Kino's without going where he went, visiting the missions he founded, and listening to those who really know his story. This is Mission San Ignacio de Cabarica in the state of Sonora, Mexico. We're here on a pilgrimage led by Fathers Greg Adolf and John Arnold. And if anybody knows Father Kino's story, they do. A religious and historical tag team, Fathers Greg and John's personal insights at each stop of the pilgrimage brought these centuries-old walls to life. 
Then presto changeo, they donned vestments to prepare for mass and remind us we were, after all, in church. But then, every once in a while, a great jewel like Father Pino and the center of mission activity was Father Kino ranging out onto the entradas, on the long journeys into the desert areas. Father Campos sort of forming a base camp here at San Ignacio, which allowed those journeys to happen. You need a good base camp if you're going to go exploring. This was it. Father Kino came here during his entrada to the Pima Maria Alta. The entrada, or entrance, was the first stage of the missionary process, basically a scouting expedition to identify sites with enough people, land, and water to sustain a mission. Father Kino decided this site met all three conditions. It would be six years, however, before the people here got their first missionary. When they did, they got one with staying power. He was Father Augustine de Campos. Father Campos gave 40 years of his life here. That's pretty impressive. This is one of the most distant outposts in the Spanish Empire. You have to respect what the man accomplished. So at the time of Father Aquino's death in March 1711, it was his friend, Father Augustine Campos, who buried him and wrote the notice of his death to the other Jesuit fathers. What did Father Campos write? What was in that death notice? Who was Father Eusebio Francisco Quino, anyway? On August 10, 1645, Eusebio Francisco Quini, his last name later Hispanicized to Quino, was born in Senio, Italy then part of the Holy Roman Empire. Although we may think of old Europe as timeless, Eusebio's was a world that was rapidly changing. Only three years after his birth, the Peace of Westphalia settled years of religious wars and created the foundation of modern Europe. In science, Sir Isaac Newton would soon patent the first practical reflecting telescope, an enormous advance in the science of astronomy that was to have a profound impact on the young Italian. At the age of 20, Kino was struck with a life-threatening illness. He vowed to his patron saint, Francis Xavier, co-founder of the Jesuits, that if he survived, he would become a missionary. After 12 years of Jesuit training as a novice, he was ordained Father Eusebio Francisco Kino in Bavaria, Germany. After eight more years of training, his superiors decided to send the 33-year-old Jesuit to the New World Missions. The first leg of that journey would take him from Spain to Genoa, Italy. From that ancient port, he penned a final farewell to his native land. If we do not see each other again in this life, he wrote a friend, we shall hope to meet in another and better one in heaven. Father Kino never expressed the hope or even a desire to return. His port of embarkation for the missions was Spain, where he hoped to catch a ride with the Spanish fleet, making its annual trip to the New World. But Quino's hopes were dashed. When he entered the port of Cadiz, the fleet was there, but had already set sail. It was the first of a series of setbacks for Quino and his missionary companions. It was to be not just a year, but three years before he finally set sail. But Father Kino put the time to good use. He learned Spanish and used his scientific knowledge to build instruments he would need for the missions. As a Jesuit, he was drawing on a long and robust intellectual tradition. Father Kino was certainly building on um, what he'd studied uh, back at his home and, and back in uh, Austria as well. And certainly the authorities in science were Jesuits. Um, there was Athanasius Kircher in Rome, and certainly that, he was a big authority. And Kino certainly paid good attention to that when he came to, and uh, 
the methods as he came to make his maps. So yes, he drew on you know, his, as it were, Jesuit heritage in science. Were the Jesuits the only ones in science? No, but were they prominent? Yes, they were. A prominent celestial event in the year 1680 was right in the young Jesuit's wheelhouse. In that year, a comet visible to the naked eye journeyed across the Andalusian sky. If you look uh, carefully at the statue, uh, it's here in Tucson and two other places of Kino on a horse, and you look along the left side of the horse and the saddlebag, you'll see a funny round object is like a ring with a cross in it. That's the representation of what's called an astrolabe. Uh, the word means star taker, but I suppose it's really star measurer. It would measure the position of stars, rather like a sextant uh, nowadays can measure the position of stars, and it's really used to measure the position of the sun. And so Kino would use that um, instrument to measure the angle of the comet as he made his progress across the Atlantic, and he'd note down what angle the comet was in the sky. He then used his mathematics to try and work out how far away the comet was. Father Kino published a pamphlet about the comet when he reached Mexico and gave it to the Viceroy. It was not only a show of scientific expertise, but a master stroke of diplomacy as well. A comet was a sign actually of something bad that was going to happen, normally to someone in, you know, prominent, a ruler. And so when he dedicated his little book on the comet that he wrote in Mexico to the Viceroy, um, he was be sure that, you know, so that the, the Viceroy might receive, you know, the blessings, uh, you know, the, from this sign rather than the, the you know, the, the, the dire consequences that it might mean. Its cover illustration of Our Lady of Guadalupe was intended for a second pair of eyes. Throughout his long wait for his ship to the Americas, Father Kino had been corresponding with a powerful patroness. She was Portuguese Maria Guadalupe de Lancaster, the Duchess of Alveira. Knowing the help royalty could provide in terms of material and moral support for the missions, Father Kino made sure the Duchess's patron saint was on his book's cover. Our Lady of Guadalupe, who of course has the moon, the stars all around her, a sign of the blessings that come from the heavens. The celestial traveler was still visible in the sky over New Spain when Kino arrived in Mexico City. But Father suddenly had sobering and more earthly concerns. The bells of the city's great cathedral were still ringing with shock and sadness. Just months before, 23 Franciscan friars and 400 Spanish settlers had been killed in the infamous Pueblo Revolt in the province of New Mexico by Indians led by their leader, Pope. Father Kino would soon find himself in Pope's neighborhood, and the cathedral bell seemed to cry out, how can a Jesuit succeed where so many Franciscans failed? What's so special about them? Father John Arnold has studied patterns of conversion and rejection in the missions, and believes the success of the Jesuits, and Father Kino in particular, lay in a willingness to defend natives against the abuses of the colonial system. Well, I think the thing that would cement Kino's relationship with them is when he would defend them against the Spanish soldiers. Because when you can take their side against the people from your own culture, then they see that you're bigger than just what's in it for me. Arriving in the Pima Maria Alta in 1684, Father Kino would waste no time in allying himself with the natives against the Spanish system, first going up against the use of Indians for slave labor. Spanish law said that the Indians were not to be enslaved, except if they did not accept Spanish rule. And if there was a determination that they were not accepting Spanish rule, then they could become slaves uh, as captives of war. Since Indians could hardly be converted if they were enslaved in the mines and on ranches, peacekeeping became Father Kino's primary concern. 
and it gave he and them common cause. Christianity meant peace, and peace meant freedom. Still, though not technically slaves, as new citizens of the empire and the recipient of its benefits, Native Americans were still subject to a labor draft. And Kino, recognizing that this hindered his ability to have the Indians accept Christianity, went to the governing authorities in Guadalajara and asked that the Indians that he was working with be exempt from this labor draft. And Kino was able to convince them that the Indians would be exempt for 20 years. Father Kino's spirituality was that of a contemplative, but a contemplative in action. His youthful enthusiasm and wonder at the miracle of creation were infectious, spreading into regions he'd never visited, to people who had never even seen him. Rumors of his approach roused spontaneous receptions by hundreds of people who built elaborate arbors for him to ride through and held up their crucifixes for him to bless. A lesser man might have been inflated by such exuberance, but Father Kino knew it was not he who was saving them. He was simply bringing the news of their salvation. He was not the savior, he was the prophet. Nor did it take a multitude to move him. Like Christ in search of the one lost lamb, Father Kino, the contemplative, often went into action over the fate of a single soul. It was on the 3rd of May in 1700, as Padre Kino was preparing to celebrate Mass at dawn at Mission Tumacacari, a message was brought to him from the missionary at San Ignacio, Padre Campos, telling of the arrest of a native and the intention of the military to execute that native the following day. In response to Padre Campos's appeal, Padre Kino mounted up and rode the 85 miles, stopping at Imuris at midnight and then riding to San Ignacio at dawn in time to celebrate mass and to save that native. It's telling that Padre Campos, who was already here at San Ignacio, felt he needed Father Kino. Apparently, only the man from Senyo had the authority to save the native from hanging. Episodes like this one live long in local memory. Aodum David Tenario gained a sense of who Father Kino was through his tribe's oral history. I think what set him apart, it was just something natural with him. Uh, I think maybe the Otham at that time just saw and heard that, you know, hey, you know, here's this gentle soul, this gentle man, you know, coming through that, you know, that has you know, good things to offer. Well, many people see the Kino native or Kino Otham interchange as one-sided. Uh, that he brought livestock, he brought uh, certain uh, agricultural produce and so on. It really was uh, an interchange uh, at a much more significant level. For example, when he came into the area around Tucson and all along the rivers, he encountered Otham who were in permanent year-round settlements. These Otham had irrigation canals. They grew a variety of crops, including corn. And so it's very likely that when Kino first came into the Otham area, uh, these local residents probably taught him how to farm given local conditions because it's a very different way of farming. Uh, the climatic regime and so on, the seasons are different. Uh, and so he would have had to learn from them in many ways. The It's been said that a soldier marches on his stomach, and the same could be said about a missionary. With Father Greg, discussing food and the simple act of eating is paying homage to both Father Kino and his converts. I've been hearing so much about food and the, you know, what Father Kino brought up here. These villages, these riverine villages, farmed tepary beans, squash, corn, the, the sacred triad of Native Americans, but with the introduction of European food and winter wheat, it broke the cycle of feast famine in some way, where March, April are called hungry months in the native language. You're out of food. And with the introduction of winter wheat and beef, cheese, you break that cycle and there's food year round. 
that was part of what attracted people to the villages where the missionaries were, is seeing that source of, of food and that abundance of food in a land of some scarcity. But it was an exchange. They were also bringing to Padre Quino and the missionaries, they were bringing the, choya, the, the, the buds of the staghorn choya, the saguaro fruit, the tunas from the prickly pear, they were being pitayas, another cactus fruit. There were a lot of foodstuffs being grown and, and harvested from the desert here that was part of that exchange. And it was really a kind of an extending of the table both ways. In lands where there's not a lot of cash, hospitality becomes a medium of exchange. And that welcoming others to your table, welcoming others to share what you have, is really uh, the, what that in encounter was all about, was extending the table. It kind of resonates farther back into history. It goes all the way back to the table of the Lord and the extending of that table. There was a certain bond of relationship. We get the Spanish compañero, companion, pan, bread, those with whom we share our bread. So if we're companions on the journey, we're people who share food, we share the bread for the journey. And that goes back to the Gospels and before that into the Hebrew Scriptures of that sharing of food. So it was very natural for Father Kino and the other missionaries to extend the table, share the food and the techniques of growing it, harvesting it, uh, herding it, and to receive the gifts that the people living here, the indigenous people who lived off of this desert for hundreds and hundreds of years to accept the gifts of food that they brought to the table as well. We have a saying that if you eat a flour tortilla, wheat flour, not corn from down in southern Mexico, but wheat tortilla and barbacoa or beef, you are paying tribute to Padre Quino. Likewise, the wonderful white cheese of the area and the quince, the mimbria. But the obvious question arises, how could Native Americans, Jesuit missionaries, or anyone else raise crops or graze cattle in a desert? The answer is in the nature of the Sonoran Desert itself. Of all the world's dry places, the Sonoran Desert is perhaps the wettest, with two distinct rainy seasons, one in midsummer when the monsoons arrive, and another in the winter. Beginning with just a trickle, rivulets build into streams and streams into rivers. The receding water leaves broad, flat, moist plains ready to till. The Odom had been farming riverbeds like this one for thousands of years in the New World when Father Kino arrived with cuttings and seeds from the old. But that wasn't all he brought. The Sonoran Desert also had higher elevations where grasses could provide forage for his cattle herds. When Father Kino traveled from mission to mission, he usually brought with him herds of livestock. He was building an empire, all right, but it was an empire of faith. For him, cattle were, quote, another temporal means which our Lord gives us for the promotion of these new conquests. Many of the pilgrims told me that their favorite mission of the tour was San Antonio de Okitoa. I tended to agree. Maybe it was the gently ascending approach that made us feel like pilgrims, the humility-inducing brightness of the facade, or the meticulous work of its caretakers. San Antonio is visible from the village below, a sentinel for the living, and a guardian of its surrounding cemetery. You know, the Irish have a nice way of saying it. We say those who have died are never very far away from us. They've only gone from here to God. Aww. And that death does not have the power to break that community apart. The communio sanctorum, the communion of the saints. And so that's why the, we surround the churches with the cemeteries so that you're still part of that, that community, that living reality of the body of Christ, of the communion of saints. The other wonderful thing is we had a Father Sanui uh, uh, who was Opata uh, Spanish, he was, and he was stationed here, and he worked miracles in the 1830s. 
and he, fascinating stories. He bilocated. He was seen kneeling in the church here, and at the same time, because the river was flooded, he was giving the last rites in Tubatama to a dying person. But he just knelt here, and they saw him in Tubatama giving the last rites. His superiors were questioning his whether he was holy or just a little off. And he came, the story is he went down to he went down to, to to meet with the Franciscan provincial. It had been raining, raining heavily. Father Sanui took off his cloak and hung it on a sunbeam and walked in. <laughs> At which point the, the the superior told him, "It's okay, go on back. Nothing. We don't have anything to talk about." The Kino missions of Sonora share a unique naming convention that unites a saint of the old world with a local village in the new. You have the Spanish name for the saint, San Antonio, St. Anthony, and then a local Native American place name. So you have, you have uh, San Pedro y San Pablo de Tubutama, and you have San Ignacio de Caborica, and you have San Antonio de Oquito. Which shares an additional distinction among Sonora missions. The building is the most authentic and original Jesuit chapel. Many of the other churches that Kino founded were subsequently modified or replaced by uh, the Franciscans who followed the Jesuits. Although the mission structures of Sonora shared many practical features, such as thick high walls to keep out excessive heat and provide defensible positions against enemy attack, their structure was also highly symbolic, a symbolism Father Greg calls transformative. When we see these churches, these are places of powerful vertical intersecting and transforming the horizontal of my life and of my village. The a narrow rectangle dictated in part by the length of the beams that you could get. Those are mesquite. Can you imagine that mesquite would grow that big? Well, they were at one time. You'll also see then the cane that holds the earthen roof in place. Look at how wide the walls are. To uphold the structure, to uphold the roof. But again, this powerful vertical, do you see it? It's also a great defensive place. As you can see, it would need to be at times almost a fortress. One of the beautiful things about the practice of the faith and the expression of the faith was holy drama. Holy drama, which invites you to enter into the story, not simply to read about it, but to enter into the story. And to that, for that reason, you'll see that the large crucifix here, that's an articulated uh, figure. That is that the arms at the shoulder will fold down so that you can take the Christ off of the cross on Good Friday, and you can put it on a side altar, a tomb for, the, for Holy Saturday, and with it goes the statue of Mary accompanying the Christ figure to the, so it's drama that's enacted, but all of the participants, everyone gets to take part in that and be part of the event of Good Friday and Holy Saturday. Whose image is more only less important than Jesus' image in these churches. Mary. What does that say about women? What does that say about the role of women? What does that say about the place of women? So that's a powerful nonverbal that says women matter, and women matter very much, and women are very essential to the story. That's transformative. Women did all of the hard, heavy lifting and plow, uh, digging and planting and harvesting before the missionaries got here. Once the missionaries arrive, that's shared. Men and women, the men don't stand and watch the women do that work and excuse themselves because they're gonna go hunting later next week. Uh, <laughs> once the missionaries arrive, we all work, including the missionary and Father Kino, and I'll share some of that with you. Father Kino said, if you wanna be a successful missionary, you have gotta get your hands dirty. You have gotta work right alongside of them. You have to have a trowel in your hand. You have to be working right with them. That's transformative. This is Mission San Diego de Pitiquito. Like most of the missions in the Pimaria Alta, it was founded by Jesuits during Father Quino's time, fell into ruin, and was later revitalized by the Franciscans. But here, Mexican conservation experts have uncovered something truly unique. Let's take a look. It's called the Memento Mori, remember death. You are mortal, you are going to die. Don't lose sight of that reality. 
And so a memento mori, usually with a skull and crossbones, that memento mori, that reminder of death. In 1966, a young girl was here at mass with her mother and she glanced over onto this column and she saw emerging from under the whitewash this image of a skeleton. They had used a brand new powerful detergent and it had actually weakened the whitewash to the point that the underlying picture could come through the whitewash. The, um, the church of course emptied in terror as these images began to appear around the church. The, then, the, then to add to it, writing appeared many, many tekel foreshfaren from Daniel chapter 5, that you have been weighed in the scales of justice and found wanting. And that's the hand that wrote on the wall at Belshazzar's feast. And you can see the hand, the writing hand, writing the letters, Daniel chapter 5. Remember death, and you will be weighed in the scales of justice, and you better not be found wanting. So it's a powerful kind of reminder of death and also uh, a, a kind of reminder of the last judgment. A point driven home on the very next stop of our pilgrimage. We'll come on into the church now and we'll start uh, mass in a little bit. This beautiful structure, with the equally beautiful name of La Purísima Concepción de Nuestra Señora de Caborca, the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady of Caborca, was the first assignment of Sicilian Jesuit father Francisco Javier Saita. Tragically, it was also to be his last. Padre Francisco Javier Saita was a young Sicilian Jesuit who arrived in the Pimeria and the missionary in 1694 in October and uh, was assigned to an isolated mission village, Caborca, against the advice of Padre Quino, who helped him to get established and brought herds of cattle and sheep into the area to support that new mission. In a series of letters between Seta and Quino, he reveals an enthusiasm that rivals Quino's. In the spring of 1695, trouble in villages north of Padre Seeta's mission erupted over native resentment against Opata tribesmen who were been assigned as for, for ranch foremen and overseers. That trouble erupted and there was killing up in Tubatama. Piman villagers then from Tubatama and Okitoa, the next village down, came to Caborca on Holy Saturday morning. Padre Seeta greeted them at the door and noticed that there was anger and resentment and that gave way to violence. He was shot to death with dozens of arrows, clutching a crucifix that he had carried in the procession in his village the day before on Good Friday. And so the joy of Easter was blood splattered with the blood of the very first martyr of this area, Padre Seeta. But Nuestra Señora de Caborca would not die with Father Saita, not with Father Kino at Mission Dolores, just a day's ride away. Well, day's ride for him anyway. Within three years, his workmen were here, molding the earth into adobe bricks and tree trunks into roof beams. During the Franciscan period, the mission would have to weather periodic attacks or the rising waters of nearby Rio Concepcion. But each time it came back, it was better than before becoming the beautiful, enduring structure we see here today. This is the mission of Saints Peter and Paul at Tugutama. It was the seat of religious administration for the entire Pima Ria Alta, a fact that made it the scene of a tragic event in 1767. In that year, for reasons best known only to himself, King Carlos of Spain issued a decree banishing every Jesuit from the Spanish Empire. The Jesuits of Sonora were brought here, ironically enough, to their very own headquarters. They were gathered from all over Sonora where they had served most of their adult lives, 
Yopata people and the Spanish settlers. Here's where the edict from the Emperor of Spain was open, all over the world as it turned out, and read to them for the first time. They were led to an uncertain fate. The horses were taken away, they had no servants, and they were marched south as prisoners. By the time they reached Veracruz, Mexico, a third of them were dead. They were shipped across the Atlantic after that and imprisoned in Cadiz in Spain. So the Jesuits were banished from New Spain, but not before they and the missionaries of other Catholic orders had baptized an astonishing number of people, estimated by some historians at upwards of two million. To Batama survived other tragedies. It was burned in the rebellion of 1695, which as we've seen, claimed the life of Father Francisco Saita. And again in 1751, against the Franciscan friars. But again and again, the fathers raised the roof beams and hoisted the bells into the tower. Today, it's a treasure of rare decorative elements. Let's take a look. Not all the Pimarian missions survived into our era. Some are visited today only by the wind and desert sun, and perhaps by the angels they're named after. This ruin was once a mission, with a story as illustrious as its name, Los Santos Angeles de Guavavi. It was even a cabecera, a head mission overseeing its well-preserved neighbor, San Jose de Tumacacari. The first of three Santos Angeles to watch over Govavi was St. Gabriel, assigned in 1691 by, who else, Father Kino. San Rafael was added in 1732 by the Franciscans, and San Miguel the decade after that. Their guardianship ensured its survival until well into the Franciscan period, and although it survived the Pima Rebellion of 1751, just 20 years later, Persistent raiding by the Apaches forced it to be abandoned. Success, then failure. Failure, then success. These were Father Kino's trail companions for a quarter century in New Spain, one lurking behind, the other leading on ahead. Nowhere did they toy with his psyche more than in Baja then simply called California, and still thought to be an island. Only 50 miles separate Baja from the Mexican mainland, but contrary winds and currents had frustrated attempts to bring it under Spanish control since the time of the conqueror Cortes, a century and a half before Quino. In 1683, Father Quino accompanied the first of several expeditions led by Spanish Admiral Isidro y Otondo, the first, making landfall at La Paz, ended in a disaster when the Admiral's nervous men fired on local natives. A more prudent and better supplied expedition, six months later, landed at San Bruno. After setting up their base camp, Kino and Atondo set off towards the Pacific coast, only to be rebuffed by a wall of granite mountains and steep ravines. Their next attempt was no less arduous but much more deliberate, taking time to remove boulders and trees for a more permanent path. Finally, on December 30th, 1684, the 39-year-old Jesuit felt the hooves of his horse sink into the sandy shore of the Pacific Ocean. It was the first time Europeans had ever crossed Baja. It felt like the start of something big, but it was not to be. The barrier this time was not geographical, but geopolitical. After the Pima Rebellion in Sonora, the missions of northern Mexico needed strong leadership if they were to recover from the disaster, and Father Quino's newly demonstrated skills in California made him the obvious choice. 
Although the dream of solving the geographical mystery of California and bringing Christ to its inhabitants had eluded him, reluctantly but obediently, he headed for Sonora. California's loss was Sonora's gain. During the next quarter century, Father Kino founded no fewer than 20 missions in the Southwest, sometimes establishing them within days of each other. The foundations followed a pattern, striking out with a small contingent of Spanish soldiers and Native Americans, Father Kino made his entrada into a new territory. Along with basic religious articles needed to begin a mission, he brought gifts, seeds, fruit tree cuttings, cattle, and even religious paintings like the one that inspired his own mission, Our Lady of Sorrows. Wherever he found souls to convert, water and land to cultivate, he left a few soldiers to begin the construction of the mission's first buildings, whom he left in the charge of a Jesuit companion, or sent for one from the regional provincial at Oposura in central Sonora. On his first entrada in 1687, Father Kino founded the mission that would be his base, Our Lady of Sorrows, Nuestra Señora de los Dolores, at the village of Cosari on March 13th, then Mission San Ignacio at Caborica on March 14th, and finally Mission San Jose at Imoris on March 15th. Three missions in three days. It was a blistering pace, but Kino was just getting warmed up. In 1692, he made the first of several important expeditions into territories north and west of his base at Mission Dolores, going as far as the village of Bach, the present-day city of Tucson, Arizona. Moving further north two years later, he discovered the ancient ruins known as Casa Grande and continued west, visiting villages along the Gila River. In 1697, he made a return trip to the village at Bach founding its now famous iconic mission. Kina was back in the Northwest in 1700, penetrating as far as the junction of the Gila and Colorado rivers, where natives spoke to him of a path to the great Pacific that did not require a boat. Here in the far western part of the Sonoran Desert, there doesn't seem to be anybody around, but this oasis supported human life for thousands of years. It's called the Springs at Quito Baquito, an autumn Indian name. Father Kino, arriving here in October of 1700 on the feast of the Roman martyr San Sergio, named it after him. Father Kino was on yet another of his far-flung desert treks. This one was more like a triumphal march. At village after village, natives held their handmade crosses up to him, or their children, for him to baptize. Stopping here to water his horses on his way home, Kino couldn't resist one more attempt to resolve the mystery that had so long intrigued him, whether or not California was an island. This was important because if there were a land bridge to California, it would make it easier to establish missions there and resupply them. So, starting out in the evening to avoid the heat, Kino headed for the coast. Just a day's ride away from it, at the top of a ridge with his supplies running low, Kino unslung his telescope and pointed it at the coast. Unfortunately, Hayes blocked the view that day. The California mystery, though, was about to be solved, and this time, it came right to him. He didn't have to go search for it. In March 1700, a group of Maricopas, natives from the Yuma area around the Colorado River, came to Padre Kino with a gift and a request, an appeal for him to come and evangelize, share the good news with them. The gift was a cross upon which was strung 20 abalone shells, blue shells. Excited by this gift, he issued a summons to the chiefs of the whole area to meet with him at Mission San Javier del Bac. And there on the 28th day of May, 1700, as they laid the foundations for what he described as a spacious, large church and the predecessor of the beautiful dove of the desert that we see today, the natives spoke to him about these blue shells that came from the Pacific coast and assured him that there was a way to reach those shells in that coast overland. This excited Kino's interest in the two journeys to the Rio Colorado to establish 
that California is not an island and that there is an overland trail which would allow him to supply the missions of Baja California from the flourishing missions of Sonora, Arizona. Proof that California was connected to Mexico by land strengthened the effort already underway there to establish missions, an effort led by Father Quino's friend, Jesuit Juan Maria de Salvatierra. Salvatierra founded Mission Nuestra Señora de Loreto in 1697. It served as the provincial headquarters during the Jesuit period and was the base from which Franciscan Junipero Serra would carry the missionary effort into Alta California in the next century. Salvatierra, encouraged by frequent correspondence with Father Quino, founded the second Jesuit mission in Baja, San Francisco Javier, the year before Father Quino's Blue Shell Conference, with its proof of the land bridge that would facilitate the resupply of these and the other missions Father Salvatierra and the Jesuits would soon set up in Baja. This is Mission San Javier del Bac, near present-day Tucson, founded by Father Kino, and the place he held his famous Blue Shell Conference. As we'll see, this Baroque jewel of the Southwest missions is as important aesthetically as it is historically. Our mission, the, we who live in Tucson think of it as our mission, it really belongs to all Tucsonians. You know, it's, um, it is our cultural uh, treasure. It, for us, it is, it's our Taj Mahal. Uh, it's also our Sistine Chapel in my opinion, for its internal ornamentation um, and the repli you know, replete Baroque interior, but it also has this exterior form that is just this white uh, apparition floating in the desert heat. You know, it's just, uh, it's the maximum cultural expression of Southern Arizona. Baroque refers to a style of 17th and 18th century European art or music, characterized by exaggerated detail, motion, and high drama. The Catholic Church promoted Baroque art during the Counter-Reformation to infuse energy and passion into its stories and teachings. Tucsonians, even those who revere Father Kino's legacy in their region, are quick to point out that it was not Father Kino who built San Javier del Bac, but the Franciscans who took over the Jesuit missions in the Pimaria Alta after the former were expelled. This is the legacy of Kino, but it's not Kino. He founded the church. It was the Franciscans who followed a century later who built the present-day church. Um, so it is a flowering of, um, of you know, Catholic um, architecture that expresses the meaning of the church. If you look at the floor plan of San Javier del Bac, it makes the Latin cross. It has the nave and the high altar, and then it has a crossing, the two side chapels. Uh, the ceilings are 33 feet high, and the, the way the building is built, it's made of brick, and the entire roof is made of brick domes and vaults, which is unique among the Spanish uh, missions in the United States. There are many in Mexico, of course, but in the U.S., San Javier del Bac is the only one with a domed roof. The facade presents the visitor with a welter of detail but, as it turns out, all of it carefully planned. One of the things that makes San Javier del Bac unique among the Mexican churches is that all the saints on the facade are female. And I'm not aware of any other Mexican Baroque church in which this is the case. And the saints include Santa Barbara in the upper register on the west, Santa Catalina, for whom our mountains north of town are named, the Catalina Mountains, uh, Santa Cecilia, and Santa Lucia. And they're all in these niches. Now, um, above the main entryway, there is a balcony, above which is a scallop shell, uh, rendered in plaster. Now, the scallop shell is a Franciscan symbol. Uh, it's a symbol of the pilgrimage uh, to Santiago de Compostela in northwestern Spain, which St. Francis of Assisi was known to have made personally. And uh, the, the pilgrims of Santiago carry with them a scallop shell with which they would drink from streams as they traveled or uh, beg alms. So to this day, the scallop shell is a symbol of that pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. Um, and so we're in a Franciscan church, that scallop shell appears again and again as a Franciscan symbol. And then directly above the Franciscan scallop shell is the Franciscan coat of arms, the third order in which you see the, the cross, and there's two arms crossed and nailed to the cross. There's a bare arm symbolizing that of Christ, and a robed arm symbolizing that of St. Francis of Assisi, who in his lifetime 
experience the stigmata. Um, and then there's also this looped knot. It appears sort of like a pretzel. It's a three-looped knot. And this is the Franciscan uh, cord. And it symbolizes the Trinity, the three loops, which actually is the origin of the pretzel, too. The pretzel that we buy in, in bags to watch the you know, football game. It actually began as a religious symbol of the Trinity. All this religious symbolism is invested in just the facade before you even enter the interior. <laughs> Once you're inside, completely enveloped by the architecture. You're in this otherworldly environment. The walls are three feet thick, which is very sheltering from the desert heat. In the rich mix of cultural traditions of the Arizona-Sonora borderlands, where Yaqui or Odom Native Americans worship alongside Mexican Americans and Anglos, the old shares space with the new. In preparation for a very special celebration at Mission San Javier, these Odom women make tortillas in front of the mission over an open fire grill, exactly as they did in Father Kino's day. Inside, a folk jazz ensemble serenades the effigy of 500-year-old San Francisco. When someone invokes that name, most Catholics assume they are referring to St. Francis of Assisi, but not in southern Arizona, and certainly not on this particular date. Tomorrow is the feast of St. Francis Xavier the patron saint of missionaries, and the namesake of Mission San Javier del Mar. We're witnessing something not often seen outside traditional religious festivals of the old world. Every year on this date, the parishioners of San Javier remove the effigy of St. Francis from the retablo and proceed with him around the plaza in front of the church. The festivities draw people from the entire region, some even coming from Mexico. The source of this kind of enduring faith, Father Eusebio Francisco Kino, the founder of this church. The figure used to make the effigy was originally that of Christ on the cross at Tumacacari Mission. Around 1850, with Apache raids threatening that mission, the figure was moved a safer distance north to Mission San Javier, where, about the year 1890, it was recast as St. Francis. Celebrations such as this have been taking place every year since then. Following his dramatic parade around the plaza, St. Francis is brought back into the church and replaced near the altar. While autumn musicians keep up a chant, worshippers wait their turn to visit St. Francis. These private visits may be acts of petition for a cause, the cure for an illness or an affliction, just as often they are visits to thank St. Francis for his intercession. The act of touching the saint is similar to one in which the worshipper leaves with him a small token, a milagro. Milagro is Spanish for miracle. Using them to petition a saint is a custom that can be traced back to the old world, but is more common among indigenous people in the Americas. At San Javier del Bac, the church is the center of the community. Um, people are baptized there, confirmed there, married there, buried there. It is truly a living church, which makes it all that much more special because many people see San Javier del Bac as an artistic icon, as an example of the Spanish Baroque, you know, the finest example of Spanish Baroque architecture in the United States. But it has greater importance because it still serves the purpose for which it was built. It's still the Catholic Church for the Tohono O'odham. 
Father Aquino took his final rest on the same pack saddle pillow and doubled calfskin mattress he'd always used, surrounded by the converts he'd always served. Father Campos wrote an obituary, in which unfortunately he got Father Aquino's age and nationality wrong, and repeated the error that he had mapped the island of California. How do we even begin to write an obituary for a life as rich and varied and productive as that of Father Eusebio Francisco Kino? Perhaps we don't. Father Kino's story, after all, really doesn't have an ending. Those who came after him built on the foundation stones he set, tended the fields he planted, and nurtured the seeds of faith he sowed. In today's parlance, we'd say they kept it going. In Father Kino's, they went mas allá. I'm Jim Kelty. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you again here on another search for the faith in faraway places. Heavenly Father, source of all holiness, you raise up within the church in every age, sons and daughters who serve you and your people with heroic love and dedication. You have blessed your church through the life and ministry of your faithful servant, Father Eusebio Francisco Quino. He has taught and preached well of your divine Son, Jesus Christ, and was a true instrument of the Holy Spirit in touching the hearts of countless people through his missionary ministry in the new world. As he joyfully accepted your divine plans, I ask you, according to your will, to hear my prayer, offered through the intercession of Father Kino through Jesus Christ our Lord.